How's it, guys? Welcome to another epic conversation on The Expanded Show. I, uh, I'm, as always, truly excited to bring you this week's episode because I really believe that everybody listening or watching uh, will take something away from this that can benefit their life. So uh, I got to sit down with a friend and colleague, Stuart Whitehead. Uh, I've known Stuart for about the last year and a half. We work together um, in a professional environment, and I've also got to know him on a personal personal basis. He's definitely been a mentor for me in my life, um, uh, in all areas, and uh, I've learned a lot from Stuart. The conversations that I genuinely have with him when we were together is just it's always profound, insightful, and I always take something away. Uh, so I had to get him on the show because what he has to offer, as you will see or hear, is, uh, is amazing. We tackle the subject of health and wellness, but we, we go a lot more deeper than uh, the kind of surface level stuff. Uh, we look at a whole range of things um, to help you live, live your best life, basically. Stuart doesn't get sick, he'll, he'll tell you that. Um, and uh, to, today's episode will, will help you understand why, um, why it doesn't and how it's possible to, to live a life where you're, you're truly, truly happy because every aspect of your life is, uh, is working in uh, coherence. I, uh, we are, as the expanded brand, we're also super excited to be partnering with Entourage Oil, Going to be distributing it if you guys are interested. It's a, it's a whole plant extract from the cannabis plant and it's intended to really get your body into that homeostasis and help with healing. It's an amazing wellness supplement, um, a lot more than just an overpriced CBD oil. Um, I'm going to put a link in to, for you guys that are interested to read up more about it. If you are, reach out. I'll hook you up, and uh, this stuff has, has worked wonders in people's lives. Even if you don't have any health um, health problems at the moment, uh, I promise you it's, it's such an amazing supplement to add into your life. Uh, the endocannabinoid sum- system is something that I have only recently learned about, and I think it's criminal that we don't know more about how we can use this plant and use it um, for the benefits that it can offer. Guys, without further ado, we're going to delve straight into the episode. Let me know what you think. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks, guys. And uh, we took off out of Cape Town, we were flying somewhere. As we turned out, I looked at the beach and I saw the guys kiting. I was like, sure, it's a nice day to be kiting. And you looked at me and you were like, oh, do you kite? I think since then we've just had really cool conversations uh, mm. ever since we've flown together, worked together. Uh, we've, we've chatted about so many different things that I think a lot of people might consider a bit crazy. Uh, but I've definitely learned a lot from you and taken a lot of ways. Um, so that's obviously how I wanted to get you on today, chat about a couple of things. Uh, I want to kick this off with you. I'll never forget you telling me that you basically in the best shape of your life now, physically, mentally, all of that. Um, I want to delve into how you got to where you are today, a bit about your history, just a bit of a background on you. And then what was like a turning point? What was it for you that made you embark on this journey of wellness and overall wellness, put it that way? Well, I guess um, growing up, you know, always um, sort of believed uh, that I was generally quite healthy and fit and I used to do at school a lot of sport and um, from cycling to swimming and athletics and rugby and you know generally ate healthily and loved the outdoors always camping and hiking and being in nature so it wasn't like I had this like really unhealthy life and then sort of decided to to wake up and start to 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 do something about it but I guess um after school you know we get busy with our careers and um in my case I was I learned to fly and went to the air force and they taught me to fly and uh, you know that was quite a, a good environment as far as you know they expect you to be fit and healthy and, yeah you know they're always pushing you well in those days they used to push us quite hard in the physical side of things to make sure that we yeah. kept our discipline and our, our fitness yes. and uh, I guess that was always a good uh, sort of foundation for me mm-hmm. but then as you progress into your late 20s and early 30s you know I found myself not being as disciplined as I used to be and I uh, stopped cycling and I used to windsurf as well when I was um, in my late teens and early 20s and sort of also living mostly up uh, in, in the interior of South Africa, 
it's difficult to do those kind of water sports. You know, you do them on the dams and things, but the ocean is always, uh, for me, the, the most beautiful place to, to do those kind of water sports. You get more wind and you've got the waves. and Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, Tari in the ocean this morning, we, we can't live without it. It's without it, yeah. It's something that's an integral part of our life, but yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, um, got, um, you could say, a little bit uh, lax, lackadaisical on the exercise. And, yeah, uh, you know, just a little bit of running, went to gym a bit, but uh, didn't keep the... Um, the discipline and um, you know what it's like in your late 20s early 30s you start to go to a lot of uh, sort of social things and yeah say drinking a bit too much I don't say that I was like a you know just more socially but probably like all of us more than than we should <laughs> yes and, uh, sort of letting go on the health of the eating and getting more lazy because we get busier in our careers yeah um, and um yeah, look, getting, you know, with time constraints, not eating the, the food that we should. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, and I guess somewhere in my mid-30s, um, am I allowed to give my age away? <laughs> yeah. Probably about 16, 17 years ago, I went uh, with a friend of mine, I went for a run. Yeah. And in my mind, I was always thought myself as you know pretty fit and healthy but mm. you know how we we delude ourselves mm. at, at that point I probably hadn't been running for like six months and okay. not being very healthy and I literally couldn't make it back around the block Wow. Okay. and it was like holy you know moly yeah. I, I need to I need to do something about this yes I guess that was a good turning point for sure and uh, since since then I've lost um, about 30 kilograms slowly mm. over a period of time and it wasn't something I just said oh, I must lose 30 kilograms mm. it was just a process of you know taking one step at a time cutting out all the the processed foods and the carbs and mm. getting more down to eating fresh fruits and vegetables together with um, you know normal mm. food as well not just being uh, I'm not a vegan yeah. but I, I do tend to have more vegetarian food now yeah, but uh, back diet. then it was more, more removing all the, you know, the processed foods, the sugars, and too much carbohydrates, and mm. cutting down on drinking alcohol, especially like beer and things, which is quite yeah. fattening. And that was in those days more f- for a weight thing, mm. and to get fit, and then just starting to do more exercise again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think in our in our industry specifically, or in our industry, drinking culture is a big thing, partying and all of that. And yeah. as you get older, like you say. Um, you do tend to slack on, on the health side of things. But also, we weren't as aware. I think there's a lot more information nowadays um, to make us more aware of that. Well, the internet yeah. um, is obviously more and more information on it mm-hmm. and um, a lot more um, people publishing books I mean, with Amazon.com yeah. and the availability of yeah. Kindle version of books. You don't have to buy them on hard copy. or and If you do, they are easily accessible. Mm-hmm. You can get them mailed by, by Amazon and other book suppliers. Okay. So more and more availability of, you know, information, yeah. I guess. So this is a case that you, as you're getting older, you realize, okay, sure, um, I've got to, got to be a bit more aware, a bit more conscious of, of my health. Of my uh, health. And, and, yeah. and like you said, it's not just about, okay, I need to lose 30 kilograms and make it a crash course diet. It actually becomes a lifestyle. And how do I implement the steps slowly yeah. so that it's, it's a lifestyle and not just a, a thing to lose weight? Or what. But I suppose that's obviously how you embarked on the the more the wellness journey that you're mm. on now. And I guess also it was um, very gradual. So mm. like I would lose like four or five kilograms over a period of time and then it would stabilize mm. and then I would like get to another point and say, okay, that, that's good and I can push my exercise a bit more and mm. you know maybe refine the diet a bit more and then it would like another period of a few months, another five kgs or so it would drop off and then Mm. it would so it was very gradual and it wasn't there was no goal in mind it wasn't like I have to weigh 90 kilograms uh, which is about what I weigh now but it was um, just let my body stabilize where it's happy and just let it go you know Mm. gradually and then um, yeah one day I came I was still living in Johannesburg I live in Cape Town now obviously Mm. but about 15 16 years ago 
I came down to, to about 16 years ago to a wedding in Longobarn. And I used to live in Longobarn when I was in the Air Force. I spent three years there, so I knew it pretty well. And in those days, in my early 20s, I used to windsurf. And I had seen kites and for, you know, kite surfing kites, mm -hmm. you know, um, on uh, TV and uh, in the internet and, you know, read about the mm -hmm. kite surfing. How, when, what year was that? It must have been a good few years ago. It was 16 sure. years ago, so it's that was kiting, 2004, like a, 2005. Okay, that was the infancy of kiting, that was sort of just starting. Yeah. Well, it, was, it started apparently in the 90s, late 90s, but oh, really? there were, the, the kites around then were still very, like, new design yeah. and the, the, the technology wasn't that good. For sure, yeah. <laughs> if you look at the, the, the kites back then as opposed to what we yeah. have now. And I saw a couple of kites, uh, um, you know, the, we spent the weekend in Longabon and saw a couple of kites and went down to have a look. So I asked where, where the kite surfing school was and mm -hmm. I, I went off there and said to the guy, the owner of the school, I said, yeah, I used to windsurf and everything, so kite surfing will be a natural extension. I'm sure I'll pick it up quickly. And he just laughed at me and he said, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and uh, yeah. booked uh, about uh, two weeks later uh, some, uh, some lessons Flew down to Cape Town, went up to Longabar and did some lessons and uh, ended up uh, being totally hooked on kiting, just like mm -hmm. that. And uh, bought my first kite and everyone said to me, yeah, you're like 35 years old, 40, uh, going on for 40, and uh, how are you going to start something like kites if you're going to go rip muscles and ligaments and break bones? And, yeah. and uh, I guess it wasn't so much that I did it for the, the pure exercise because it's much more than that. It's mm. an experience with the ocean. Um, it's obviously physical exercise, but it's, it's an incredible way to spend time mm. with the elements, you know, the wind and the waves and the ocean. Yeah. And um, it became more of like a, a journey for me. It's, like it's, it's, a, it's more of a passion than just yeah. some, some, some like afternoon out having a bit of exercise. And uh, the more I pushed myself with the kiting, the more I realized that, um, yeah, I'm not going to be the world champion freestyle kiter um, at my age. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I, my whole, I just watched my whole body change, like the muscles, the ligaments, the strength, the core strength. And there's many other ways to do it. I mean, these yeah. people who do all kinds of disciplines. Yes. But it made me realize that this... Uh, you could say, general idea in society and the, the things that people were saying to me that at certain ages you shouldn't be doing certain things. Yeah. That you're actually, your body is so intelligent and we have more uh, capability than, than we can ever think. So I, I just felt and went with what I felt in my body. And, um, and then obviously started surfing as well as, mm -hmm. a by, as a byproduct of being in the ocean, sitting on those days when you're waiting for the wind to blow. Yeah. And uh, getting frustrated, <laughs> yes. waiting with your kite and yeah. can't wait to get in the water, yeah. especially the early days of kiting. So I started surfing as well, which I'd ne never done before. And um, that's a, a beautiful sport in, in its own. I mean, yeah. it's uh, a like one, it's, wonderful exercise and you, you're mm, in that beautiful ocean. It is. It's like you say, there's something about spending time in the ocean. Yeah. And uh, I started kiting and I think I was in, in high school, I managed to get a second in a kite from a friend of mine. <laughs> And we used to, literally when there was wind, would be on the beach kiting. And it's one of those sports that it's quite frustrating to learn uh, for a lot of people. It doesn't, you don't just get it overnight. Yeah. Um, it's, it, takes, it takes a while. But once, once you get going, it's one of the most rewarding experiences. And you can't really explain to somebody who hasn't done it. Mm. Uh, but kiting in particular, I found, is, is, it's like you said, an experience. And there's mm. nothing better than getting in the ocean for hours to get out in your old days just that much brighter or surfing or... And there's something something amazing about the ocean, for sure. Mm. We've traveled around the world. You've done some kiting in some interesting places. Mm. Um, I remember you were telling me about the Philippines. and Philippines um, and uh, Sri Lanka, uh, northern Brazil, and um, to Mauritius a few times, and to Rodriguez, this little island off Mauritius. Okay. Namibia. Um, the Namib uh, nice and windy there. Yeah, I can They imagine. have the world kite surfing and windsurfing speed championships there. Yeah, I've the seen the footage of that, it's insane. Guys are going like 55, 54 knots over the water. Um, I didn't take part in the competition, but I did go out in the morning before the one, one day of the competition with my 
kite into the lagoon there and it was about 45 knots the wind and uh, you can literally you're just hanging on for dear life but it's just an experience to try and figure out how these guys can control those those kites and, and windsurfers at those speeds with those winds it's just incredible i mean those guys are really good yeah yeah and yeah. what are those places like compared to South Africa? I mean, I haven't been able to travel in kite. I've only kited mostly in, in South Africa. Uh, but I know foreigners come from over the world. Yeah, we've got one of the best places. Yeah. I, I still think it's criminal to, to live in Cape Town and not, not kite surf. Exactly. Um, what have you found experiences elsewhere like compared to South Africa? So most of the places that I've went kiting, except for Namibia, were mostly tropical places. And the tropics are beautiful places to, to, to do water sports. It's, mm. I'd say more benign, but tamer. Mm -hmm. So the water's warm, and normally you have a reef, so you have like a flat section inside of the reef for those people who don't like the waves, and then normally it's like in Mauritius, you can go through the reef and you can get out into the ocean and, yeah. you know, do some wave riding, and if you just want freestyle off the waves. So, and also the wind, you know, off the warm water, it's not as dense, so 20 knots in the tropics, is uh, not, just doesn't have the same strength as 20 knots that's coming off this cold ocean in Cape Town. Okay. So the wind here is just more powerful. It's we've got mostly a Nishigar to Longabon, you know, mostly like quite a uh, you know rough coastline with good mm -hmm. waves and um, and cold water. Obviously, people in the tropics go, go kite surfing there. They get the lovely yes. warm water. Sure. So I think it's um, it's. Um, more challenging in the Cape, but I think overall it's probably one of the best places that I've ever kite surfed. You don't, the conditions yeah. are just there for everything. For sure, for sure. Yeah. Uh, but also, I mean, traveling to kite just adds such a nice extra element to traveling. Instead yeah. of traveling for the sake of traveling, you're going to go kite somewhere in a new place, new destination, and must make the whole travel experience something else. Exactly. Um, something that we've chatted about a lot um, is, uh, which I know you've got quite a keen interest in, is the detoxing and cleansing yourself and cleansing your body. I think from what I've experienced and learned, especially in the society today, if we don't look after ourselves in terms of what we eat, you know, what we expose ourselves to in terms of EFs, um, environment, stress, mm. all those things, if we don't take care of ourselves almost on a regular basis and actively detox and cleanse ourselves, and um, you can very easily run into health problems. We've chatted a lot about parasite cleansers and those, that area, I know you've got a, a friend in Dubai who's, yeah. who's had a quite keen interest in all of that. Um, was it was he? His name is Malcolm. Was he the guy that got you onto all of that? Yeah. That's like because I've heard some incredible stuff from you, and especially the parasite cleansers, because I think parasites is something that not many people are actually aware about, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, and it could actually be a cause of a lot of health problems in people. Mm. My first step to become more healthy was obviously in the physical body. Okay. You know this. You know moving oh, okay. moving the body. Sorry, I'm getting myself. No, no. <laughs> so no, no, moving the body. Yeah. You know, getting your Losing weight, uh, building muscle tone, mm -hmm. not just muscle tone for, you know, to look good, but to really keep, you, you know, the strength in, in, in your, in, in, around your joints to, to maintain your, your, um, your body. And, and, and the, the, well, I was always told that as you get older, if you don't do it now, you know, it's going to get more difficult. So to get to that point where it's more effortless. And uh, you know, not just kite surfing and surfing, but still running. I love trail running, and um, you know Natasha, my better half, and uh, she's uh, she's an ex Springbok triathlete and uh, nutritionist, and she's um, an expert in training the physical body. So she's helped me a lot with more toning and stretching and doing. Um, some exercise routines which really strengthen the core, but I guess kite surfing does that does mm -hmm. do that as well. And uh, in strengthening the core, I think that was you know like a good foundation to if you've got a strong core, you you you're not you're not going to end up with back pain and all kinds of other things. But the next logical step was you know learning to eat healthy, and uh, I guess when you look at uh, how we taught to eat in the Western world. And the information that has come out in the last, especially in the last five, six years, about Western diets, um, we can go down that rabbit hole, but uh, I think we're all <laughs> pretty yeah. much on the same page there. Yeah. It's just to start refining. So one of the big things for me then was understanding that uh, what's important to get into your body is, is nutrient-rich nutrient food. So, um, and what is nutrient-rich food? So the more research I did, 
um, the more I realized that, you know, if, you, if you're going to go and follow the mainstream um, sort of protocol, um, 90% of the farming is done in Western sort of methodology. And in, in doing that, you know, we, we can start going down that rabbit hole too. First of all, spraying glycophos or gly glyphosate roundup into the soil before they plant, which uh, destroys all the weeds. And, um, you know, what is a weed? It's a plant. You know, everything that's on this, on this, on this earth is, I guess, there for some reason. But anyway, so they, they spray and destroy the, uh, any, any growth that's in the soil. And uh, glyphosate is a water-soluble chemical that um, wreaks havoc in the environment and within us. Yeah. But what it does do is it destroys the microbiome of the soil. And in the microbiome of the soil is um, if you take a teaspoon of healthy soil that hasn't been sprayed with glyphosate, mm. um, is um, full of uh, about a, a teaspoon will have about 7 billion little microbes in. And uh, after it's been sprayed with glyphosate or Roundup, it's uh, drastically reduced. And those little microbes are responsible for many, many, many you know, aspects of sustaining life on this, on this earth. So a plant would be planted, like a crop, say wheat or um, corn or whatever it may be. And um, those microbes are responsible for um, passing on the nutrient value in the soil to the plant, so making it bioavailable to the plant. So it would uh, pass on all kinds of nutrients and... Um, Processes it will also help to combat you know diseases in the roots of the plant, even up the stem of the plant, because the microbes grow up the stem of the plant. And, um, and then, obviously, um, not being able to um, absorb the true nutrient value that, that is locked in the soil because they haven't got the microbes to make it bioavailable, the plant is only getting a small portion of what should be taken in and turned into. Uh, the beautiful process that becomes food that we eat. Mm. Um, so the Western farming is going to put the fossil fuel related chemicals into the soil they call fertilizers. Um, and instead of relying on the natural fertilizer process, and um, we get something that looks like uh, a nice big ear of corn or mini or yeah. a big juicy apple, but what is the density of the nutrients in there? Being uh, apparently, according to stuff that I've read, uh, something that's grown organically in, in, in healthy soil has seven times the nutrient value. And yeah. that is where our body is really building from. It's the nutrients we put in it. Mm. The, 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 the beautiful um, sort of uh, substances and um, nutrients that are, are, are locked into that soil um, that, that cannot be absorbed by the plant, which then we need in the processes to, to sustain us. The, the corporation is doing that. Is the end goal is mass production of food. It's mass production, yeah. To, but at what expense? I mean, at mm. the expense of our health. I think I listened to, uh, it was a podcast with Zach Bush, and also yeah. talking about the Roundup glyphosate and how it actually destroys our gut inside. It does I, that I can't, too. You know, I can't remember all the details of what he mentioned, but it was just it was horrific to realize we're actually putting this into our body. It's into our body, yeah. And uh, yeah. I think uh, I think it's we've definitely I mean as a society I think we've lost touch with, with we've lost our connection to pretty much everything and one of them is food we don't realize when I mean, we eat all day we don't realize what we're putting in our body mm. I always I, I I've been on the, the kind of health journey for a good few years and more of the plant based diet but I wasn't really into the organic I didn't really assume I, it was that much of a difference until I really started looking into it mm. hearing about it from you and and we've we've started only eating organic and getting our stuff from the market mm. out in Philadelphia where you stay. And uh, yeah, like you say, you don't you might not get the biggest, juiciest looking thing, but you know that that, that sweet potato or that carrot or whatever has been grown organically and the nutrient content of that is so much more mm. than buying uh, mass-produced stuff that has been... Yeah, you yeah. think about it, all these beautiful elements in the soil from you know, the natural phosphates and zincs and magnesiums and, you know, all the things our body needs, um, they're in the, in the soil. And um, these microbes help to absorb them into the plant. And um, so then, and then obviously, once the plant, the, the crops are certain size, they spray them with insecticides. 
which um, um, you know the resi residue of that going into our bodies is not going to help us too much either. And then, um, as you were talking about our gut, which yeah. is a mirror of soil, because we've also our gut is full of microbes, and um, one of the biggest um, destroyers of the microbes in the gut that I've learned about over the years is is you know taking antibiotics. Mm. Um, there may be a stage where it may be very necessary for you to take antibiotics if we have a really bad infection or something that we're really struggling to, to get rid of. And um, so it would be just be more mindful when you do take antibiotics. Do, you, do I really need them or am I just using it to get quickly over some like flu or cold, which your body will get rid of anyway without the antibiotic? But it, you know, obviously in, in a severe case where you really have a bad infection, um, yeah. yeah, take the antibiotic, but then know that you have to do a bit of work to repair what the, the antibiotic does to, to our bodies as well, because it knocks out the microbiome. And yeah. our microbiome is obviously responsible for allowing us to then absorb all the nutrients that we eat. And if yeah. you've got a compromised gut biome, a lot of the nutrients are just passing through you, and you're not getting the building blocks, which are the true building blocks of, of you know, the cells, everything that makes us as, as human. And uh, getting a, a small portion of what we're supposed to get into our bodies is obviously over a period of time, you're going to have uh, a decline in, in your health and, and, and the, your abilities to just have a normal life. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the gut health is definitely something that we don't, we're not really taught about unless you go and actually look into it yourself. And I think the mainstream healthcare system and antibiotics is a whole other rabbit hole. But I remember growing up and it was just, oh, you have, you, you, you're a bit sick, go to the doctor, antibiotics, antibiotics, antibiotics. And obviously not knowing much about it, but learning about it as I got older. And Tara had a, she had quite a bad infection. She went to hospital and they pumped her full of antibiotics for a few days. And her gut's never been the same since. She's just been struggling with her health in, in so many ways. And obviously you can't prove it, but it's like, mm -hmm. we, we look at that and we think, oh, um, what damage are these antibiotics doing in, uh, yeah. in, our, in our gut? Um, like you say, completely destroying the, the gut uh, microbiome. Oh, but it's learning, not, yeah, sorry. So I learned about how that's, they call it like the second brain almost, yeah. uh, how much more processes our gut is responsible than we think, even in terms of our yeah, serotonin production, all that kind of stuff I think you mentioned to me. Yeah. Um, A lot of our serotonin is made in the gut. Mm. Our immune system um, is obviously direct, directly related to the health of our gut. If you have a poor uh, gut or microbiome, your immune system, generally, if you measure somebody, uh, this is obviously, I'm not a scientist, this is just through research and evidence in my own life, but mm -hmm. um, apparently if you measure somebody with um, immune system, immunoglobulin is a um, substance found in the saliva, um, and you have a poor gut biome, and eventually you get to a point where you can build your gut biome, there's a definite correlation in the strength of your immune system just by improving your gut health. Mm. Another thing that compromises gut health is um, you know, excessive alcohol intake. Uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with having a few glasses of wine or a few nice beers or whatever it may be that you, 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 you partake in. But if you are binging quite regularly on like large amounts of alcohol. Alcohol is a solvent. So if you ever take a really strong vodka, for instance, put it in a glass and throw some spinach leaves in and stir them around. And after a period of time, you'll see, in, in, in a short period of time, you'll see the, 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 the clear vodka start turning green. Um, it actually dissolves the plant wall, the cellulose wall, um, and uh, the chlorophyll comes out. So if you know alcohol is doing that to cellulose, what is it? It's it's actually um, dissolving some of our gut biome because they're tiny little microbes. So if if you have a lot of alcohol and it's before it's absorbed, busy, you know, hanging around in the gut, it's uh, wreaking havoc. Also, the gut wall is only uh, one cell yeah, thick. Yeah, it's like it's super thin. Eh? Super thin. Mm. So the the microbiome is also there to protect and help protect that, that gut lining. Mm. If you knock the gut biome out, you get all kinds of um, strange things happening. And one of them is uh, leaky gut syndrome and possible, yeah. uh, um, you know, uh, infectious diseases and things that we don't want in our bodies getting through yeah. because it's a very large, apparently uh, about two and a half tennis courts in area 
Yeah. Something like that. Yes. Some, some crazy surface area our, our gut has. So and you can imagine one cell thick, you know, you just one little injury in that in the in the gut wall and you know pathogens and whatever else can get through yeah and that's what the microbiome does yeah for sure and I, i'm just thinking back to that i mean that, that podcast that i mentioned earlier with zach bush you're talking that's what you're talking about the glyphosate actually destroys that thin barrier mm. so then toxins all kinds of things can get through there into our system and wreak havoc on us because our literally our lining of our gut gets destroyed by all these yeah these chemicals and whatnot. Mm. Uh, one of the things that you do is obviously actively make sure that I think it's a good to cleanse your colon and, and, and just take care of that. So I know there's a good supplement that you use in the bulldozers mm. and there's natural herbs which actually get in the crevices, as you explained to me, of your gut and colon and cleanse mm. that out. Um, do you recommend that to people to actively do, uh, take care of, or cleanse out themselves? Or what is your protocol in terms of that, making sure that you keep a good butt, gut Gut microbiome going. Um, well, this is this friend of mine, Malcolm, who, yeah, and also just to put it here, you know, there's a lot of sort of medical diet terminology going on here. So, so I'm not a, a professional mm. scientist, yeah. but this is anecdotal and it's experience that I've gone through and I've noticed uh, going forward with all the things that we're going to chat about is radical, massive changes in, in my personal health, mm. meaning. Um, five, six years ago, I was probably still getting flu once or twice a year. I don't get sick anymore. I literally do not get sick. Um, and um, the doctor was always there in the back burner in, in my mind, you know, that little safety net. You know, there, there's, there's the, if you've got something wrong, go to the doctor. It's not, even, it's not even in my world anymore. Sure, if I had to go kite surfing and break my leg and I needed to get some bolts put in, I'm going to go and see you know, a really good surgeon who's got a lot of experience and is qualified to be able to do that kind of work. And that's where medical science is really, really good. Um, you know, in the, in, the, in the technology they're brought into being able to operate and, and, and fix things like a, a really good orthopedic surgeon can do if you've been in an accident. But um, as far as health goes, you know, there are a lot of medicines around that can give you a really good intervention and really help you and stabilize you in certain situations. But I think long term, we have to look at being more responsible for our health, not just palming it off on somebody else and saying, you know, can you please help me now? I'm sick. You know, you got sick for a reason. And um, I think just for me to be, to realize that we all should be a little bit more responsible. And uh, the longer, the, the more we look after ourselves now, the more quality of life we have and I guess it's not an obsession to like run around trying to be healthy it's more like getting these programs running so that we can get on with a healthy life so without thinking about it yeah. but going back to the bulldozer a very good friend of mine in Dubai was going uh, through a very tough time and his health was also going down and he ended up going to the states and meeting a man there who um apparently had come from a very poor family and had left school to go and work in, in, in a, lead mine, a lead factory, a mine, where they would smelt the lead. And, and he was in, working in the smelter. And apparently after many years of working in the smelter around where the, the lead is melted and, um, and then taken out, and he had to scrub apparently parts of the smelter. And he ended up getting severe lead poisoning. And this guy's teeth fell out and his skin peeled off. And, um, apparently his hair fell out and he, you know, he went to the doctors and the hospitals and after three or four years of battling, they said there's nothing much more we can do for you. And he turned to, to natural healing and um, the, uh, some recipes that had been passed down for generations in some people that he knew, natural healers. And uh, the one thing was what is now today, they call it the bulldozer. So it's a mixture of natural herbs and, and medicines that basically very gently, so they're not laxatives, which if you've got a blocked colon, um, would, would uh, just try and get um, you very unnaturally to try and get rid of everything inside of you. So this is a very gentle process. And you must understand that a lot of the toxins that are filtered out through our body, we're taking in toxins through the way we breathe, in the air, um, mm. from heavy metals to all kinds of other chemicals, 
Yes, as you mentioned, the lead, I was thinking that the heavy metal issue we have nowadays is also another reason to constantly, I suppose, detox, because we're detox. exposed more to it. Yeah. Well, I think what's in fossil fuel that we burn mm. from airplanes in the upper atmosphere that are burning these fumes that are coming out the exhaust mm. to our cars and everything else, it's power stations and you know, lots in, in, in those fumes of so heavy metals and all kinds yeah. of other toxins. Um, there's... Um, We've spoken about the food, mm. so you're going to get residual insecticides and other bits and pieces that are in in the in the food. Mm. Um, what we rub on our skin, yeah. so our skin absorbs things deep into our body. Yeah, you know what are you putting on your skin? Yeah, you know, read the back of the label. That was a big sh- paradigm shift for me, I suppose, and I, I almost laughed at it when I heard about the, you know, you would just lackadaisically like spray stuff under your arms and stuff. Where uh, it was full of aluminium and all these these things in these yeah. products that we put on our skin, but which actually gets absorbed into us. Of course, and aluminium's uh, a neurotoxin. Yeah, damages our uh, uh, neural pathways, and they and they put it in most deodorants if you read on the yes. back. Yes, so I only buy the natural stuff now, which is great, and I've and I've definitely noticed a difference over the last two or three years of using that, and just be more aware because there's so many elements mm-hmm. to health, and, and what gets absorbed through our skin is also one thing that you don't even think about. Yeah. Um, that's quite crazy. Somebody told me once, and I, uh, you know, you can go research every little chemical that's on the back of a cream if you want, but all these long words that you can't pronounce are generally things that you don't want to put in your body. Mm. Um, you go buy an expensive cream to go and uh, make your skin look good, the, and the, you go and somebody said to me one day, um, there was a, somebody we met and she had really good skin and I said, Yo, like how, how, or what do you, you know, is it genetic or you use something and she said, yeah, olive oil. <laughs> really? Been using yeah. it for like five years. Yeah, extra virgin olive oil. Yeah. So, Less if you want to well. call it commercial, commercialization, products, mm. marketing, uh, the push for making massive profits, I don't, I don't know what you want to call yeah. it. Yeah. A lot of these creams and uh, so-called lotions that we put in our body yeah. are possibly, um, we've lost the, the fact that simple things like just olive oil or macadamia oil or just a simple, like shea yeah. butter or whatever Natural it may stuff, be, yeah. is going to, just on its own, without all the additives. Mm-hmm. If you want it to smell nice, you can put it in essential oil with it. And, yes. You know, it's, it's going to do, it's, it's full of the rich building blocks that your skin will use mm-hmm. to make the elastin and collagen that, that your skin makes, the proteins that it makes to, to repair and to you know, make it yeah. regenerate. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's the, the main... Sh- what a big revelation for me was learning that... Because growing up, you almost think doctors are gods, you know? Yeah. But realizing that they actually don't really do much training in terms of nutrition and, uh, and that side of things. And the alternative um, health stuff nowadays, which used to be considered people would kind of laugh at, I, I see it is on the rise in terms of awareness, but there is still a kind of skepticism towards uh, natural healing and mm. looking after yourself instead of relying on a doctor. Of course. Uh, they're quick to give you pills to help sort out the, mm. the, the prob- not, not the root of the problem, but the, the mm. symptoms and all that. So, so what the bulldozer does, does is, um, um, so, so this, this, this guy in, in the States, he uh, apparently started using this formula okay. and, um, what it does is, um, the, so your liver will eliminate as many toxins as it can. When the blood flows through the liver, it tries to take out as many of the toxins that are meant to be in our body. Um, and then what it does is it dumps it down into the gallbladder and then out into the duodenum. Um, and then those toxins will slowly pass out through, through the colon. But through waste and diet, being lazy, destruction of microbiome, and when I say lazy, not moving our bodies, sitting sedentary behind computers and in offices. And, you know, we need to also move our bodies to get the, the whole process of our, our whole system to operate properly. Everything becomes a little bit stuck. And being in the colon, in that part of the world, in our bodies, um, obviously a lot of toxins that are pulled out through the liver are just getting bogged down in, in the colon. And over a long period of time, apparently, according to um, these kind of homeopathic remedies, is what happens is we build um, on the wall of the colon and in all the little crevices, because it's such a large surface area, um, from the small 
intestine to the large intestine, um, you could say <coughs> a kind of a, um, a build-up that is not removed because also a lot of the Western diets, um, quick foods, fast foods, you know, highly processed foods, so even just getting down to like fruit and vegetables with a lot of fiber to try and that it helps to clean out the colon. A lot of people don't have a lot of this in their diets. So we start building up these residues that stick in the little crevices of our colon and um, the toxins build up in there because you know they're also being flushed out of our body through the colon. Um, for one of the one of the organs of elimination, but a lot of it does go that way. Um, and th that buildup of toxins is becoming, becomes even more toxic, and so you reabsorb it. And in the case of this, this, this man in the States who started developing this, this um, bulldozer, he uh, had obviously uh, a lot of the lead residues obviously built up in, inside of his body through whether it was inhaling the fumes or however it went through his skin, whatever, but obviously his liver trying to get rid of them and dumping it out through the, through the colon and it was being reabsorbed and maybe his whole process wasn't working well, his elementary canal. So he started taking these bulldozers and what it does is it gently goes into all the little crevices and it just pulls out that residue that's been stuck for a long, long time. And it just gets that whole elimination process going. And a lot of the toxins that are stuck to, get, to take them out. And uh, within, within six months, his hair grew back and his skin healed. And obviously, you know, when your teeth fall out, that's, that's pretty much yeah. that's on, that, on that front. But yes. he regained his health and became a very vibrant, healthy individual again. And he was so taken by this, this formula that he started learning about lots of other types of medicines as well, natural medicines. But this one is one, one of his mainstays. And Malcolm found this stuff and he, it changed his life overnight. Um, his, his health issues um, and um, he's never looked back obviously that was a catalyst to learn a lot more yeah. but um, so the bulldozer is something we had a lady young girl 25 years old who came to Natasha because Natasha is working with the bulldozers um, she'd seen three specialists and she was just totally blocked up she wasn't going to um, her colon just was not working. She tried every laxative. She had been to specialists. She was actually getting to the point where it was starting to affect her health very adversely. And she met Natasha, went on the bulldozer for two weeks, and she phoned Natasha two weeks later crying at the relief, not that how her life had just changed in two weeks. So there's definitely a, a lot of things that have been sort of pushed aside in the, 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 the run mm. of mainstream medical science. I'm not saying it's got many beautiful things that do help us in this world, but you know, a good balance, I think, is, uh, is very necessary. You know, explore, explore options if you're struggling, yeah. you know, especially things that are natural and that mm. have been tried and tested by people who can give you know, their advice and say, it worked for me. I mean, it's, as long as it's um, natural and it's, it's not going to harm you. you know, mm. Give it a try. Yeah, no, for yeah. sure, definitely. It's yeah. interesting. Yeah, I um, I did a podcast with a guy last week, an amazing guy, Pat, and he had been diagnosed with brain cancer. Yeah. Also, just chatting to him about going down this whole journey of all the natural ways and, and mm. the oils and the this and the, uh, the 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 mental practices like meditation, these kind of things, and, and looking after your health and mm. diet and. It's, uh, you can really cure yourself um, with, you know, being open to exploring the, the natural way of, of healing yourself, the way your body's meant mm -hmm. to heal, I suppose. Of course. Um, well, it, it, intrinsically, that's your, your, each cell in your body. There's a very um, great um, doctor and author, um, Bruce Lipton. Yeah. So he's a biologist and geneticist. Yeah, you introduced me to him. That's yeah. fascinating. And he explains so beautifully how the cell of an organism works. Uh, the cells, we've got about 40 trillion odd, there's variations, some people say more or less, but around about 40 trillion cells in our body. Um, and he goes into the process of how a cell works, and it's just an incredible process. And built into you, every cell is like the strand of DNA, and that is the source of the code that will make the protein for that cell, like a, a lung cell, a heart cell, a muscle cell, um, a skin cell has the proteins collagen and elastin and our body produces all these beautiful proteins 
from amino acid chains, amino acids we get through the food we eat, and there we go to the nutrition. Mm -hmm. So the richer your, or let's just say the more uh, organic and rich the soil is in which you get and, and, and toxin-free the soil is, the more nutrition you get from the plant, the more amino acids, the more building blocks your body has to, to build the cell. And if you follow people like Dr. Yeah. Bruce Lipton, he explains it like nobody else can explain. Yeah, he's, he's, he's got definitely a good way of explaining it. Yeah, uh, yeah he's fantastic. And I love how he, he breaks it down, which I think is such, I mean, you can apply it to most areas of life and how it all boils down to environment and how environment is key. Yeah. Uh, so even yeah. on a cellular level, the environment that you put that cell in is mm. how it's going to you know, manifest into what it can do. Of course. Yeah. So the yeah, so basically intrinsically what I was trying to get at is that your body has the natural intelligence to heal itself. And it's all the influences from the outside, if we want to talk just in the physical body, the toxins we take in and the stresses and strains we put in our body that constantly are creating, like, like for instance, you get exposed to a disease and your immune system is not up to scratch, so it takes you down and you become sick. Yeah. Um, putting poor food into your body, putting toxins into your body, mm -hmm. and these cells have to work harder and harder and harder to eliminate mm -hmm. the toxins and to regenerate and heal. And we're now putting foods in our bodies that possibly aren't as rich in natural resources and... and, and um, the elements that we require yeah. so they're not rebuilding and regenerating properly and so we get weaknesses in our systems and eventually manifest this disease yeah. but um, the cell has the intrinsic intelligence and here we are trying to uh, fool our bodies into thinking that if I put this chemical medicine or whatever it is into my body it's going to fix me you know, it might hide the symptoms mm -hmm. but in, deep in each cell is the intelligence to do the healing automatically yeah. we don't even have to think about it and uh, I guess that's the process that going down this road of getting the body physically strong, being able to, you know, withstand as we get older to in the physical muscles and the structure of our, my skeleton and my joints to keep them strong and healthy so that I can live a, live a, a quality of life. Mm -hmm. And then obviously going into the processes like we're talking now about the way we eat, being more mm. mindful of what we put in our bodies, being mi more mindful of the environments and the toxins that go into our bodies, mm. to free up that natural intrinsic intelligence that can do its job, and then hopefully not having to go and visit the doctor very, very regularly, which is which yes. is where you know I think I've got to that point in my life. In terms of. People are so quick to want to rely on medicine or like now, for instance, during this period specifically, a lot of people are pushing for the vaccine and I just feel like maybe it's, we're looking at the wrong thing, we're looking for a cure, maybe we can boost our immune system to the point that we shouldn't have to be worried about a flu virus that's going around. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, like you said, your body can heal itself and we, we build to fight off bacteria and toxins and bad viruses or whatever. Uh, uh, yeah, what, what is your thoughts on that? Well, personally, um, due to my stance on, you know, limiting, you know, artificial chemicals that I put into my body, so, and and to antibiotics, and unless I really have uh, such a bad infection that I realise that you know I need help, um, you know, I'm not yeah. going to be arrogant. Yes. Um, and obviously, science um, has brought humanity a long way, not just in medicine, but you know, I mean. Machinery, yeah. technology, uh, IT, te um, all kinds of incredible technology. So, but I think this there should always be a balance. Meaning, um, you know, this 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 world, this earth, has got so many beautiful creations on it. I mean, all the animals and the plants and the way everything and the way life interacts and participates and you know, you know, has learned to. Uh, dance this beautiful symbiotic mm. sort of dance and develop to where it is the, where does that intelligence come from you know w w what is driving it I mean can we manipulate something from scratch and I'm not talking about genet genetically modifying something can, can we make DNA from scratch you know can we do that I, I, I don't know not, not that I've read or Mm. But um, so there's an intrinsic intelligence out there, and there's a beautiful harmony and interaction, and we are part of that. Yeah. So 
I think there should be a balance between the pure science and the ability to understand that we are also part of that symbiotic dance mm. of, of this world. We're not yeah. excluded from yeah, it. Yeah, we're not separate from it. We're right. not separate. Yeah. So going back to the immune system, I truly believe, I mean, long before this COVID outbreak, um, I haven't been going to the doctor for years, and I don't, and I don't get sick, mm. and other people around me do. And I have got no different genetics. I've got three sisters, and one of them is following um, a pretty healthy diet and looking after herself, but you know, the others um, are not. And maybe they're prone to getting sick more than, 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 than us who look after ourselves mm. more. So what I'm saying is, is genetically, you don't have to start going into all like, uh, this one's got a predisposition for this genetic disease, but just generally like year to year, like having flus and cold and everything. Um, if you look after yourself, I think you can stave that stuff off by, um, and I say, I'm not a scientist and I'm not going to go into how uh, it's measured and uh, studies and, but from my own evidence and yeah. the things I've learned in my life, I don't get sick anymore. Yeah. So I think our immune system is boosted by a number of things. And that's true. And I've also, I have done some reading on it. Yeah. Um, obviously, by trying to eliminate toxins out of our lives, having good detoxes every yeah. now and again. And that bulldozer we spoke about is yeah. one of them because it helps to pull the toxins out yeah. through the colon. And there are other beautiful ways of detoxing. Mm. Um, so, for instance, um, going on a like a, a, a vegan for me, some people are obviously vegans, mm. but if I like for a two week or a one week period, like go and source really good quality food and um, vegetables and fruit and eat as healthy as possible, and then towards the end of that, go on a, 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 a juicing fast. Mm. And but try and push the fasting as hard as you can. Yes. Meaning, if you can do it with water for as long as possible, okay. and obviously, it says allowing the body, because you're not taking in all these complicated uh, um, substances mm -hmm. of eating all this stuff that we put in our bodies and drinking all these things that we do in life. You're just giving your body a break, and yeah. it, it, it's cleaning, allowing your body to clean house and to. Yeah get rid of all the junk and to just out of, out of from the cellular level just to pull everything out mm -hmm. and go through the normal organs of elimination which um, yeah. is uh, sweat through the skin and then obviously through the colon uh, through the urinary, urinary tract yeah. uh, we breathe out toxins and um, yeah just to allow your body to just get to because itself. getting rid of all that junk just allows the natural intelligence of the body to kick in and start to regenerate and heal it okay. just gets rid of all the the noise and you know it allows your body to focus on what it's supposed For to sure. do yeah the fasting fasting has definitely been something that's kept coming up through the years and i've tried a couple of fasts and i was skeptical a few years ago with fasting and but i i must say once you look into and listen to the experts speak about uh, the longevity and the cell regeneration and all that from the benefits of fasting mm. and giving your body that break it's definitely uh, quite powerful to, to do intermittently it is. every now and then um it's definitely something that I would highly recommend. Yeah. But like you say, there's different ways of doing it, and there's uh -huh. different ways. But just basically giving your body that break and not just eating constantly all day, every day, which I think we're so used to doing uh, in society. Something else that really interests me, um, I've been on the physical health uh, interest in terms of my diet and been more on the plant-based side of things for a few years and obviously seen massive benefits in that. But then looking into, as I've looked into people like, I know you're also interested in Dr. Joe Dispenza, even Bruce Lipton, all these guys, John Keo, who are on the forefront of merging science and spirituality and all of that, um, putting into our body uh, food or what we eat and that is, is one thing, but then something that we don't really consider is the our emotional state, our state of being mm. and, and that, that stressful lives we live day to day, which we don't sometimes realize, learning about the sympathetic, parasympathetic systems, um, all of that and how our health is directly impacted by that. It's been quite phenomenal for me to understand, especially the role that emotions play. Mm. I know we've chatted a lot about this. Um, what would you say that you do in your life, or how how have you how do you approach that aspect of keeping your yourself away from that that negative environment and line negative emotions to negatively impact your health? Mm. So now you now you've touched on something that uh, is probably that. The tip of the iceberg is 
all the stuff we've been talking about. Yes. The eating and eliminating toxins out of our bodies and, um, you know, generally um, exercising and being healthy. And obviously those things are fundamental. They're like the foundations. So, but I think probably that's in my humble assessment, probably about 20% of the work. Mm -hmm. That's just to sustain the frame and get the cells going and everything running like sort of seamlessly in the background. But um, when you start delving into emotional states and our perception of this world and how it triggers inside of us, every emotion triggers the autonomic nervous system, which is the hormonal system. And I think that is the 80% of our understanding and learning about the incredible technology that we, we have in this body of ours. And uh, the, that is where we truly start to, um, I think, heal at the most fundamental level, is understanding the, what our hormonal system or our biochemistry and, and neurochemistry is capable of. And... Um, you can do any amount of trying to fiddle with it from the outside, meaning putting substances into your body, be it mm. medical drugs, as in pharmaceuticals, to try and solve problems. And some people go down that horrible, terrible rabbit hole of putting in all kinds of other drugs and things into their body that, you know, trying to escape mm. the reality of dealing with these emotions and things that have come our way and um, end up, you know, destroying their bodies even, even further. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, to, to cut a long story short, your, your personal emotional state is going to create a biochemistry that is unique to you, like a fingerprint is unique to you, like your eye, uh, iris in your eye is unique to you, mm -hmm. like your DNA is unique to you. And, um, and I think where the problem lies, um, and this is also just purely a lot of research and reading, and then it bringing the things into my life to mm. see how they work for me. And I think the fundamental biggest change for me was to start understanding these things, because mm. that's where my life really started to shift. Yes. And um, one of the most uh, eloquent um, people that I've you know learned a lot from and researched and read and, and got, followed a lot of his work is Dr. Joe Dispenza. Mm. And he, yeah, you put me onto his, yeah. his work, and I got and he's a geneticist, yeah. yeah, and he's a neuroscientist. Yes, I think a neuroscientist. He's absolutely phenomenal. And uh, the research he's done for the last 20, 25 years, he's brought into such practical ways of, you know, bringing it into our lives. That um, yeah, it's incredible stuff. And there's many other great people out there who've done similar stuff, and that all blends into Eastern philosophy. Yeah. Uh, which is, you know, meditation, I can't say is Eastern philosophy, but, you know, the East has a very strong attachment to mm. utilizing those modalities to, to, to bring, you know, healing into their lives. Mm. But um, to come long story short, uh, any negative emotional space or anger, frustration, depression, anxiety, and anything like any, 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 if you want to just term it broadly as a negative emotional space or state, um, triggers and pumps cortisol into our system. And cortisol is a great uh, uh, hormone to have in our bodies when we have a, a real threat. So if a guy comes running around the corner with a knife and starts running towards you, you know, you're going to get an adrenaline boost and a cortisol boost and you, everything's going to go to the muscles, all the energy, all the blood flow, and you're going to fight or flight. And um, you obviously you're going to try and mitigate whatever the guy with the knife is going to do to you, and that's what cortisol and adrenaline are there for. But unfortunately, in these modern lives that we live, there's uh, so many stresses and strains that are placed on us from you know, trying to make a living, um, trying to um, negotiate your way through the morning and afternoon traffic with all the crazy people mm. on the roads that we have these days, um, you know, more and more people, if I could say, that uh, are worried about their health and, you know, getting, getting different types of diseases and sicknesses and 
um, worrying about our children, worrying about our families, and it's a lot of stress and fear and mm. anxiety in the world. And if you th- if you look at the stats and how many people these days are on anxiety tablets or antidepressants, yeah. um, it's just a testament to to the kind of stressful lives we live mm. at the moment in society. Yeah. Uh, add to it what's happening in the world now with COVID. Yeah, a lot of people's livelihoods on the line, not generating incomes. Mm worrying about whether they're going to have a house and things to, you know, be able to support their families. Um, yeah. You know, the, the fear and anxiety is, I think, rocketed. Mm-hmm. And you can just ima- imagine the, well, the, the amount of cortisol that is going into the system. And um, so, to cut a long story short, that cortisol is basically taking your body out of regeneration and healing, your, your natural mm-hmm. intrinsic intelligence in the cell, and it's shutting down, it's like batting down the hatches, waiting for the storm, sending all the energy to the muscles. And, but it's not a physical threat. Mm. It's a perceived threat. Yeah. You know, am I going to have enough money? Am I going to have this? You know, is mm. this going to happen? Or maybe worrying about the past. Mm. I should have done that. I should yeah. have done this. Or I've uh, had a trauma and that trauma is reliving itself inside of you. Yeah. And at the same time, it's triggering cortisol. And cortisol basically breaks our body down. Yes. Um, it stops the re- healing and regeneration. Uh, it, sh- it puts us into the left brain, which is analytical. You know, everything is like nitpicked. Mm. Um, puts us into beta bre- brainwave state, which is like... Uh, if you think of yourself driving to work in the morning traffic, um, you're getting frustrated and you traffic backed up and you're running a bit late for work and you a million things going through your mind in, uh, thinking yeah. of everything you should done have done and what you should do and what you're yeah. going to do when you get to work that is that is beta brainwave yeah. state it's it's a it's a very um uh it's not a coherent state your your yes. mind is is all over the place mm-hmm. your heart rate is the heart rate variance is all over the place yes you um and it effectively shuts down your immune system shuts immune system, everything yeah down. if you're in that state that sympathetic state your immune yeah. system is put on hold I re- so, yeah i read something uh, some studies done on cortisol that it actually um it damages the neural pathways in the brain it damages the lining of the of the the arteries, which is also only one cell 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 mm-hmm. thick, um, and wreaks all kind of havoc in the system, yeah. and also shutting down that natural healing and regeneration. Yes. Um, mood, obviously, you know, sure. not in an enhanced yeah. uh, emotional state. Um, uh, depression, also, sadness, anxiety. Yeah. Yeah, I I also read something that was quite interesting about, especially with that state of fear. Uh, yeah. And quite pertinent to the the mass scale, I'd say fear driven narrative at the moment, and and being in a state of fear in, in that sympathetic state, it actually I can't remember that like I said, I'm not, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an expert, but I read something about the prefrontal cortex actually kind of shuts down the, the functionality of that, so it actually makes you not think logically, mm. so you don't think and process things as well in that state of fear, so you don't make the most rational decisions, you don't think properly, uh, so no. it affects every area of our life. Yeah, you can't. Um yeah, you're basically running so much through your mind at once. You're not yeah. analyzing it properly, and you're not making proper decisions. Yeah, fear, fear yeah. is. I mean, you you do something in a fearful state and something in a calm state. You see it in a totally different perspective. Yeah. So, um, as soon as you go into a positive emotional state, starting with something as simple as gratefulness, just being grateful for what you have. But you need to truly feel it inside of you, not. I'm grateful you know you need to feel it and feeling is something very different to thinking getting out of the brain and into the heart you know if you drive around in the car instead of thinking all the time use your brain to think and to solve problems or when you have to go and do like work and you've got like a high workload then you know use your brain it's there that's what we've been given it for Mm -hmm. but generally when you've got time in between um times of high workload or trying to solve problems or do things that you need to cognitively engage in, go into the heart, think, think about, feel the situation. When you meet somebody, feel what they feel like. Mm. Don't, like, don't try and judge them and mm. analyze everything. Yes. And slowly but surely we start opening the processes of being more uh, in that positive emotional state. Um, so feeling grateful. You know, things can be falling around like in the middle of this COVID 
the stress it's bringing into our lives and things going wrong and possibly, you know, some people's careers and futures are not as, you know, where they were six, seven months ago. But um, even in that, in, in this time and even in those, 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 those uh, you know, stressful times, you can still be grateful for things that you have in your life. You can still be grateful for your health. Yeah. And I think fundamentally, you know, we can, we rush off and we try and make these livings and make this money and buy these material goods and push for this life. But what are we without our health? Mm. And we're so busy investing in all those other things. How much time do we invest in the very thing that keeps us happy and in a good quality of life is this health that we've been given. So without it, we are nothing. Yeah. So why not start understanding that to look after this um, beautiful life we've been given and this health, that uh, don't take it for granted, start looking after it. Mm -hmm. So even in these crazy times, we can still be grateful yeah. of grateful for the people we have in our lives, yeah. the family we have, grateful for, as I say, if you yeah. have the health, yeah. if you start to focus more on that than all this craziness around us, we start to understand how we can unlock these emotional states. Yes. If you start going into gratefulness, happiness, joy, excitement, love, unconditional love, these kind of emotional states, and you truly are feeling them inside of you, you start to go into the serotonin melatonin pathway, which in, in their own right are probably two of the chemicals that we produce in our own bodies that are stronger medicines than anything else that exists. You know, that you yeah. can go and buy and to ask a prescription medication to put into your body. Yeah. And serotonin, if you go now, we're talking about emotional states, but if you go back to the physical um, discussion we had earlier, um, those microbes in your gut are producing a lot of our serotonin. Mm. The food we eat is pro or against serotonin. So obviously, yeah. so your serotonin... Yeah, your mood is directly affected by yeah. your, your state of being and what you put in That's your body. It. Yeah. One of the building blocks of serotonin is, is, is tryptophan, which is an amino acid, and it's, it's, it's in many of the foods we eat, but very, very rich in the fruit and vegetables that we eat. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, serotonin giving us that super boost in our mood, feeling you know, like you in, in, in a positive emotional state, joyous, happy, grateful, you know, just feeling good. Mm -hmm. um, it's also a powerful antioxidant. It boosts our immune system, uh, seriously yeah. boosts the immune system. Mm -hmm. And then at night time, when our retina and our eye starts to pick up that it's getting dark, we start converting from serotonin to melatonin. And that mm -hmm. takes place in the pineal gland, which yeah. is up here in the, between the two hemispheres of the brain. And, uh, and that melatonin is now the very, 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 very powerful antioxidant that uh, as, the, as the evening and the night progresses, more and more is produced by the body if you're in the right emotional state, yeah. meaning as soon as you go into anxiety, stress, fear, shuts it down. You go back to cortisol. Cortisol overrides it all. And yeah. so the melatonin is putting your body into the deep, deep, deep yeah. healing and regeneration. And it's also a very powerful antioxidant. And as you get more and more melatonin in your body, so you go from that, um, if you did have beta brain waves, the fast, mm. incoherent ones, slowly you start going into uh, alpha state, which is more coherence, mm. brain waves slowing down, and then as you start falling asleep into those theta, delta, gamma states where it's like deep yeah. REM sleep, but very low frequency yeah. brain waves. And in that state, your melatonin is at its highest and you're washing through your body. Yeah. It's literally giving your body the information and repair work uh, that, that has to be done. Mm -hmm. And that is why proper sleep is so important. I was going to touch on that now. It's something that's fascinated me for a while and a lot of things point to sleep being the biggest factor uh, with the melatonin, uh, something that's come up a lot with, like you said, Dr. George Spencer speaking about it. Yeah. And he, he actually, what starts with his work is he really puts into the graphics, like he was describing the, the brain waves mm. and how all this stuff is directly affected. Melatonin being one of them, one thing I've realized is, like you say, at night our body starts to produce melatonin naturally, but mm. these days we sit looking at our screens all night and that, that light affects the body's natural 
of course, which is one of the things that affects the natural uh, mm. process um, of your body producing melatonin. And then even things like EMF, they've done tests to, to show that if you have a high exposure to mm. EMF, so if you're sleeping with yourself next to you, all these things, it actually hinders your melatonin production. So if you break it all the way down, if you're not getting the melatonin, you're not getting the sleep, your body's not getting the detox and the yeah. proper rest that it needs, yeah. then you get things like disease and disease. all these things. So it's, I think it's like, almost like a massive puzzle, all of this health, but we have to look at all these aspects. It's That's super true. fascinating. Um, sleep being one key thing yeah. that I've realized. If I... If I am on my phone till late, my sleep my sleep is directly affected. If I wake up and I'm on my phone, I can tell my state of being immediately is not right. Mm. So it's it's quite a, a lot of conscious living that you have to implement to maintain to a good state to. of being. That's yeah. it's true. But also the um, you know, the going back to the emotional states, um, and literally the that uh, understanding of your emotional state and being aware of it, mm-hmm. being more conscious of the way we are feel feel, and every time you slip into, you, you, um, we are beings of uh, a habit. Emotional states is integral, and in that is understanding belief structures and habits and patterns, yes. and uh, what we would consider to be conscious and subconscious. So ninety five percent of everything we are today is as a result of habits and patterns and belief structures that we've identified with and allowed to become part of who we are. So an example of that is learning to ride a bicycle or learning to drive a car. You can think about the first time you got behind the steering wheel of a car and you had to learn in a manual car with a clutch and a gear shift, Mm -hmm. trying to get that coordination right to drive that car. You have to operate the clutch, change the gear, know which gear you're going into, make sure you don't over rev the car, put the indicator on to turn, look in the rear view mirrors and the side mirrors. And it's, it's a process that takes a bit of time. But once yeah. that muscle memory it becomes intact and you've built enough experience to run a program mm. or a belief or structure or a pattern, mm. it runs seamlessly in the background. And yes, you can maybe go somewhere, go overseas for six months or a year, not drive for a year and come back and a little bit of an adjustment and, like they say, it's like riding a bicycle. Within within a few days, you're back straight in that pattern and habit. And that's how powerful muscle memory, procedural memory, and wiring things into our body's subconscious. And often, you can drive a car. I can drive a car from A to B. And although I'm conscious of you know staying on the left-hand side of the road and obeying the traffic signs and not driving into, into other cars... You often, that time can be like a time lapse. You don't remember, yes. you, you're so busy thinking about other things yeah. while you're driving. Sometimes you, you're like, how did I get here? You start to worry, you're like, sure. I wasn't conscious of how I got here, but you got that's there. It. And oh. that's how powerful our subconscious is. Hmm. And the subconscious is, is a sum total of everything we believe in and all the habits and patterns that we've allowed to become part of our lives. And often from childhood, through our parents and families and friends and communities and countries and schools and universities and whatever it is that you interacted in to get to where you are now in your life, we've allowed a whole lot of habits and patterns, whether it be the way we think, the way we feel, the way we react to people, so-called our our personality, um, the way we eat, the way we perceive the world yeah. is How we've been 100% unique again like your fingerprint mm-hmm. and you're creating this biochemistry inside of you yes. so if you've had a life where you've mostly been living in a negative emotional space like an anxious person or fearful mm-hmm. or perhaps angry or frustrated um, that is running in the background 95% of you is your subconscious it's running in the background so you're yeah. pumping cortisol mm-hmm. So to understand emotional states, you have to start now figuring out what makes you tick. Mm. Like, what in your past can you undo and maybe improve habits and patterns and parts of your personality to be able to start perceiving this world and understanding that the more I go into this world in a positive emotional space and start enjoying this life, because it is an incredible life if you start living it through that lens you start to get to a point where you start to understand that a lot of our present emotional space has to do with perceptions and patterns and habits that we've built over our lives. 
So this is going quite deep and, you know, you can start delving into psychology. But we are our own psychologists. I mean, who knows you better than you? Mm. I mean, you can go and sit with somebody and discuss it and get some other yeah. perspectives and understandings. Yeah. But when we truly want to heal and you start delving into yeah. sort of like, how do I start just to be a more joyous person? Or yes. how do I just be more appreciative of what I have? Mm. Why, I'm, I'm, I'm just generalizing here, why do I feel anxious every day? And if I go pop a pill and I go to the doctor and say, listen, I'm anxious, yeah, there may be interventions when you're really in a, in a, in a, in a place where you, you need to just have a, something to stabilize you. But the, you can't live like that forever. You need to start figuring it out. And I think this journey, that's why it's like a journey for me. Yeah. It started with just getting fit and slowly but surely I started just unlocking and obviously met some incredible people along the way and you know, read incredible yeah. books from people who like, uh, have uh, a lot more knowledge than I'll ever have. But yeah just integrating my lives and trying them yes. and fiddling with them a little bit and seeing like how does this impact my life and where does it go from here. I think the, the, the biggest moment arm or leverage that I've got in my health is to start to understand patterns, belief structures, habits, slowly mm. changing them, no radical, mm. just like s mm. small shifts. And the more you, you do it, the more you understand how it works. Yes. And then into trying to have a more sort of get myself into a positive emotional space, not by pretending or like repeating mantras or this NLP and just trying to actually physically changing the patterns so that I start perceiving this world differently. Yes. And then you start going into the melatonin and the, and the serotonin melatonin and those pathways open up and literally can be measured. I know that they've done measurements on immunoglobulin and getting into positive emotional states using meditation. Mm. And over a three-day period of a meditation workshop, literally the immunoglobulin or a measure of your immune system is 50 to 100 times stronger than it was in the day you walked in. Yeah. And uh, tracking people who use these uh, modalities who have chronic diseases, from cancers to heart disease to diabetes, cleaning up the eating learning to understand how the, you know, moving the body, getting the body fit and healthy, and then starting to access the ability to start healing your life by changing those patterns and habits mm. and starting to live in the high emotional or uh, more positive emotional states that you actually start, people have started to heal without going to mm. have these serious medical interventions which sure. sometimes work and sometimes don't. Yeah. You mentioned psychology. I've also had quite a keen interest in that. And looking into specifically what kept coming up is also your childhood and what kind of patterns and beliefs and, mm. and structures that you adopt and that when you're unconscious of, if you don't do the work to, yeah. to become conscious of it, you'll keep reacting to a situation, just call it traffic or whatever. And, and getting a bit on the esoteric side, now you mentioned meditation, the Eastern, uh, Eastern tradition, that kind of stuff. For me, it's been interesting. It's, it's you know to look at how to change that state of being. I think for me, realizing or becoming more mindful and, and the mindfulness and actually being aware that we are not our mind and our thoughts that continuously mm -hmm. run. And so the first step for me was actually noticing my reaction to something, noticing my feeling or my negative emotion, mm -hmm. whether it be frustration, anxiety and that, and just noticing that state of being. And I think once we get to that place of being mindful of it, then you can take the steps to change it. One thing that I've struggled with is we we can't avoid the stresses of life, mm -hmm. especially during this time. And there's days where I feel quite frustrated and whatnot, but I definitely feel that you have to put in the steps in terms of practice, whether it be gratitude or even going for a run or doing small things to get your state of being right as well. Uh, it's definitely something, yeah, yeah the gratitude is a, is a big thing. I know you mentioned and getting a bit more esoteric. We're all vibration. And if you put up those higher vibrations and you take time to actually mm. get your state of being right. Um, but it takes a bit of work, I find. Right? And there's different techniques and different things work for different people, but you can't just decide, okay, I'm going to be positive now. You actually have to look at ways to, to you know, incorporate different practices. Well, that's why we have to build our lives. We have to build the, the, the health and the things so they're running seamlessly in the background. So, mm. you know, how many people that I've met, including my own family, who battle with health, um, mm. And uh, that 
there's, there's nothing worse than somebody who has chronic pain. I mean, it's literally there with you all day long. You, you know, it's something you just can't get, get away from. Yeah. So to go back to, you know, your health is integral to experiencing this life to its fullest. Yeah. So we need to, f- where we started this conversation, mm. get those things down pat, yeah. running in the background, so that you start focusing what I would say is the majority of the iceberg, which is patterns, habits, uh, rewiring. You know that mm. when you create a new, when you do something new, say, say I decide to st- stop brushing my teeth with my right hand and use my left hand, mm. it feels strange. But when you do it, you actually lay down a new neural pathway. Yes. And the more you activate that neural pathway, the more reinforced it becomes, the easier it becomes. And eventually, if you use both hands to brush your teeth, you might end up not really having, having a preference anymore because yeah. you've wired both parts of your brain. Mm-hmm. And in doing that, learning a new language, learning a musical instrument, learning mm-hmm. something new, learning every day, yes. you're wiring your brain. You literally, yeah. they've figured out that you're not... You're not you, 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 our brain has plasticity. Yeah, what's the term? Neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity. Yeah. So you, you're literally wiring yeah. your brain as, as, as you, you go through the day. And mm. the, the more you start pushing yourself, and don't, maybe the word pushing is wrong, the more you have interest in expanding you know, who you are mm. and what you know, the easier it becomes. Eventually, it's another thing that becomes seamless. Yes. Every day, you just have the nature to be inquiring and just yeah. try and figure things out, learn things. Yeah, sure. Obviously, you don't always want to be pushing boundaries. You just want to have fun sometimes and just be. And I think that's what I was going to add to that, how you get into those states of you know good emotional space, um, being able to access the serotonin, melatonin pathways, which go to work and do a lot of healing in the background, mm. is we have lost the ability to understand about what being in the moment is. Mm. And so a lot of the time I find myself, I'm very guilty of it, is, is, is going into the past. And, oh, I should have done this and I should have done that. And, you know, why did I go down that path? It's done. It's gone. It's part of my subconscious now and it's a pattern or a memory or a habit maybe I got from something. But in the now, in the next 10 seconds... I create my future. So in the next 10 minutes, next ten, next hour, next two hours, next three hours, rather than waste my time and energy thinking about the past, start finding solutions to change my the way I'm moving and to start figuring things out and eradicate that pain or bad memory or not eradicate it. You know, you deal with it. It's part of you. It will always be part of you. Mm-hmm. But it won't trigger you anymore if you find a solution to move beyond it. So go and do something else and learn something else and bring something else into your life that is going to bring you fulfillment. And that yeah. memory is maybe a trigger point to say, hey, but look what I have now. Look, 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 look what I've done because I've gone and done the things I should have done 10 years ago, but I've done them anyway. Yeah. It's taken me 10 years, but I, I did, I've done it. And it's that being in the moment. But well, then at the same time, a lot of us worry about the future Mm. and what can you do about the future you're worrying about what yes it might happen it might not things could change tomorrow and what you're worrying about is no longer even relevant Mm. Um, so going down that path of worrying about the past and the future how much of if you sit down and think figure out how much energy am i wasting because you've got so much time and energy um, worrying about the past and the future at the same time, how much of that time in the day am I in a negative emotional space? And add all that up. And how much are you actually in a good space and in the moment actually focusing on improving and doing things that you want to do? Yeah. And I think the more I've come to realize that the next 10 seconds leads to the next hour, leads to the next day, leads to the next week. And I'm busy trying to do things that enhance my life and to fulfill it and to bring more of what I would like to create and, and have in my life, the more I focus on that, the more I forget about all the other stuff. And you naturally just pass into a, like a, a good space mm. where you can just be. And sure, things get thrown at you, but it's now the resilience of how you get back into that moment mm. and find your, 
your your pattern again yeah. and get rid of you know the thing that was thrown at you if it's an immediate threat deal with it yeah. but if it's some arbitrary thing that could be could not be maybe go back and start creating your life how you want it and that's where we find the, the, the I think the ability to get into that positive emotional space yes I think that just going back to your mention earlier about the, the pathways in the brain and I think that notion that our brains kind of stop developing as we get to a certain age and then that's it is, is obviously old now and then old, that yeah. it was a nice analogy I, I read how if you, if you think of like a, a mountain and you go skiing and if you ski down the same slopes you eventually form a crevice there and it's like our pathways in our brain we, we do the same thing all the time but if you adopt these practices like meditation mm. these kind of things it's like a fresh snowfall and then you can rewire and create new pathways in your brain and yeah. it's all these practices which get into the present moment awareness stuff I think it's something that all of these if you look at any spiritual tradition or any mm. of these teachings it all kind of points to that present moment mm. awareness and getting really esoteric on it is all you really ever have is the present and the future and the past is just a concept everything only happens in the now mm. which has been so, it's easy to kind of uh, to get to grips with intellectually than actually know it. But I heard something the other day that was quite profound for me and it was uh, Peter Crone talking about this present moment thing and he was just saying, you know, all you ever have is now, the present moment, the, the past and the future. It's only conversations that you have, maybe mm. with yourself in your head, That's it. which is language, which if you mm. break down is words and if you want to get very esoteric is words of vibration. So if you're having anxious thoughts and you're stressing about the future and you're putting out that vibration... That's a precursor for things like anxiety, disease, all these things. And uh, so it's quite a profound thing to, to find yourself being mindful of yourself stressing about the past that you can't change or worrying about the future when, when you really get to it and realize, okay, hang on, what can I control right now in the present moment? It's, it's quite a, it's easier said than done. I'm, I'm a victim of and that's falling really out of that all the time. But just maybe finding little moments in the day where you actually become aware and trying to create more of that space, I'd say. And that's where we recalibrate and start changing habits and patterns. Mm. And the more you refine them, the more the aware you are, conscious you are of the present moment, and the more you're aware that you can change those patterns and habits and belief structures. And they impact us a lot more than you think. Um, going to somebody like Dr. Bruce Lipton, who speaks a lot about epigenetics. Mm. Epigenetics is a scientific study, and um, it uh, means, in Latin, above the gene. So many of us have been taught to believe that we have uh, are basically given the genes by our parents, and whatever is in that genetics, and if you want to go into... if. Uh, your father's side of the family is prone to cancer, you're probably going to get, have a good chance of getting cancer. And science is now proving that this is not really true. Mm -hmm. If you start following all this stuff that we've been talking about, especially the emotional states, the serotonin and melatonin pathways, the melatonin is a key because what it does is if you have a weakness in your genetics and you are really getting that pathway active and getting the melatonin through the system, through what we've spoken about, you actually don't have to go down that genetic route of if your father, his pro family is prone to cancer, getting cancer. It's only if you totally unconsciously live your life and pound it and your body and your health every day by not looking after it, that that is the weak point that will spring a leak one day and you end up you know, have, having the family disease. But if you are more mindful of it and understand these processes, you basically bulletproof yourself against that genetics. Mm -hmm. And epigenetics is basically uh, the study of how we can live beyond the DNA that we were given, meaning how we wake our DNA up, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, they say that only about 5% of our DNA is active. Mm -hmm. uh, Watson and Crick, they did the Human Genome Project, where they mapped the whole human genome. And they worked out that only 5% of our DNA is active. Okay. And the other 95% is what they would call junk DNA. But uh, scientists are starting to wonder, is it really junk DNA? Is it just not being switched on yet? Mm. And in the study of epigenetics, possibly, is that the pathway to switching on dormant parts of our DNA that will enable us to live 
you know, way beyond what we consider as, as you know, possible now, mm-hmm. you know, what, what, what is possible in the future. Yeah. And um, we are so, as a society, obs- obsessed with technology and machines. And here we have this incredible technology built into us mm-hmm. that was given to us by, yeah, if you want to say God, nature, whatever you want, the earth, yeah. inside of us. And, 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 and there are some incredible scientists who are now doing work in these um, sort of, uh, and trying to understand and unlock what's in our DNA. Yeah. And um, it's, it's be quite intriguing to see what comes out. But I think in interacting with this stuff day to day and understanding it more, you start to be able to be a measure of this. There's a, um, a very good uh, teacher, you want to call a teacher, he's, uh, his name's Sadhguru. Yeah. He lives in Sadhguru, India. Yeah, yeah. He's got, I think it's about 500 million followers yes. around the world. Yes. He even talks at some of the big medical schools and they do all kinds of tests on him. Yeah. And he can consciously change his brain waves to like yeah. gamma states within a yeah, short period of time. Yeah, they can do some profound stuff with their body. Yeah. Um, but he wrote a book called In Engineering, and so his big thing is is that what science can, what science says exists is only what they can measure. And science is only as good as its measuring tools, which is the technology they have at the time. But as we progress into the future, so those measuring tools become more and more refined, so we can see more and more of what um, so-called doesn't exist but as soon as they measure it it exists Mm. so his famous words that i always carry with me is is that um the things already exist but they just cannot be measured yet according to science and Mm. he he, in in doing his work that he has done using all these different modalities he's basically anecdotally in his own experience being able to measure things that there are no machines to measure yet and and I guess that's mm. something that I take is that to believe that there's a lot of things that are possible, but you know it's going to take time for science to reveal them. For well, sure, and and then also our beliefs in that being possible, because I think a lot of the the limits are self-imposed on ourselves mm. and and what's possible with our body and genetics and and the, of et course. Uh, but that's what I, that's what I love about people like Joe Dispenza is that. Uh, they they emerge in that science and spirituality and and, the, and they take in that field of work and they're showing mm. what was once laughed at in terms of Eastern um, wisdom and people like Sadhguru and talking about these things and changing states of being and all that. And they're actually starting to be able to measure it and see how how we can influence our own body um, mm. with the power of our, our, you know, exactly. our mind and habits, and etc. But going back quickly now to that story or the narrative of the vaccine... Mm. Um, so um, I'm not a doctor I'm not a scientist but in my little simple way of seeing things is that um, if I haven't had flu or been sick for five or six years why do I want to put a vaccine in my body you know it's that simple it's a personal choice that I think uh, as sovereign beings or individuals who so called live in a constitutional democracy should have that kind of choice so if you feel predisposed or you feel the need to want to get a vaccine, then go and get a vaccine. And mm-hmm. if you feel that um, your health is good enough and you're not getting sick and whatever you're doing, your protocol is sort of working for you, then so be it. But I think that should come down to choice. Exactly. That's for me, to be honest, the only stress I have regarding that. Like you say, if you want to get a vaccine, that's your prerogative to do that. If not, that should also be your choice. Sure. And I just, this, I haven't looked too much into it, but a lot of talk about limiting people's freedoms if they don't have a vaccine and potential mandatory vaccines by enforcing that uh, if you, you can't go do this if you haven't had a vaccine. So I think there's, hopefully we don't ever get to that, but uh, mm. I think it's like you said, it should be up to choice and we shouldn't limit people's freedoms. And I think there's many ways, in English, the old saying in English, there's many ways to skin a cat. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's many ways to get around... A lot of things in life, whether it's building a car or how how you want to go about creating something, uh, new technology. Um, I see you've got an Apple computer there. Mm. Um, Apple uses their own programs and you get the Windows-based operating systems and many others. 
So there's not only one type of software to run a computer. There's, mm. there's many different options and possibilities. And like I think that analogy is true for, you know, the medical fraternity and science. You know, science has a lot of things that they really have brought to the party that has improved our lives. Um, in medical science too, but also at the same time, you can't just write off all the natural ways of doing things. Mm. It's a balance. You, yes. you, you know, as soon as you start going down that one path of like only medical science works, mm. you open up a can of worms, I guess, because we still are living beings that, you know, benefit from the things that nature gives us, you know, all the beautiful natural foods and sure. things that we um, can go and interact with in this world. You know, we, we, we are a lot more, I think a wholesome approach is the way to go. Yes, and like you mentioned, balance and finding that balance. It's not just this that works or that that works or science or this. It's taking a bit of everything and creating that, that balance mm. in your life, I found. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Uh, any habits specifically that you do in your life or that you have on a personal level that you you, you integrate every day or, or regularly that you found has a massive shift? Any particular habit or, or so? Yeah, I guess the one, the fundamental one that's changed my life the most is understanding those emotional states mm. and trying to reprogram. It sounds like a, it's probably not a very nice word to to understand the, the, all all my habits and patterns, mm. starting with the ones that really gave me the worst discipline mm. and the worst outcomes, and then trying to figure out how I can rewire it or reprogram mm. it or change the habit to mm. to improve the way I do things every day, mm. and in doing that and slowly working over a period of time through. The bigger things, the bigger old bad habits, and then as you as you move through them to the smaller bad habits, to eventually waking up and it's it's just like I've got a new way of doing things yes. and and putting me in a positive emotional state. I think that's the most powerful thing that I've okay. obviously the eating and the exercising and everything in the background, but that is slowly but surely as you, as you do things it becomes a habit. Yeah, okay. and it's I think you so it's a, I think it's just creating good habits mm. is probably the most powerful thing that I've learned. Another question I, I wanted to pick your brain on, something that I struggle with sometimes is obviously falling into that unconscious, um, you can't always be mindful and present and, and, mm -hmm. and aware of your state of being, but sometimes you have the good intentions, you, you're in a good state, and then unfortunately your environment dictates people that potentially want to complain all day or, or just aren't, aren't in the best state of being, sometimes falling prey to their state of being because you find yourself kind of in that state of mind and you think actually hang on you, you fall prey to that sometimes because of the environment you in. do you do you ever have any specific practices that help you maintain that present moment awareness and not fall prey to that unconscious either complaining or being negative or or yeah when you're in an environment that you can't exactly control i think other people i think it's to to be grateful for what what i have okay you know gratitude so when everything's falling around around me, if it's really like it's such a bad day, is to obviously try and interact with whatever's coming your way and try and mitigate it and, you know, get out of that situation um, if you can. Mm -hmm. And at the same time is to go into just being grateful for the things that I have, like yeah. being healthy and being in a good state of mind and mm -hmm. trying to you know, work out um, whether this, whatever state around me that I don't want to be in anymore is going to last a long time or not, mm. and um, to try and mitigate it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And to mitigate it as positively as possible. Yes. Because negative things can sometimes bring re really positive outcomes because they show you, um, I think, to answer that question in, in more depth is, is, if something goes wrong, I try and figure out, is it making me fearful? Is it making me anxious? Is it making me worry? Is it making me sad? Is it making me figure out what emotion I'm feeling? And a lot of the time, it's, an, it's, it's, like, a, um, it's like a reflex reaction. We're going to fear. But why are you feeling fearful? Is your life at risk? Mm -hmm. I mean, get out of it as quickly as possible. But if your life isn't at risk and it's some perceived threat... Is I think one of my biggest lessons is to try to learn to let go of fear, let go of it, mm. because fear is very destructive, 
it shuts us down, as you said, it shuts down your cognitive thinking, yeah. you can't make, solve problems properly, mm-hmm. is to try and find that space of calm, breath, breathing, mm-hmm. taking some deep breaths. You can go and look yeah. at the uh, Hof technique and yeah. all the, the beautiful breathing, what it does. Yeah. It resets us, our it's autonomic amazing. nervous system, back to serotonin. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah so is to use things like that. Take some yeah. deep breaths, mm-hmm. take a moment, figure it out, feel where, where it's taking me. And if it's fear, if it's a real perceived threat, like somebody's running at me with a knife or there's a car driving on the wrong side of the road, I'm going to address it immediately. I mean, you, you take the fear, get the threat out of the way and then go and do something to get rid of that, 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 that adrenaline and stuff, get it out of your body. But if it's just generally things that are going on in my life and I'm just being fearful, I want to know why I'm being fearful. What, what is it going to help me to, to live in that fear? Yeah. And then to find that way back by listening to some nice music, listening to a podcast, getting your mind off it, going for a walk, going for a kite surf, going to do yeah. some exercise, yeah. um, spending time with people you want to be with. Mm. If you can't do all those things, some breathing and just trying you know, to get back in that gratitude. Definitely. That breathing is something like I keep saying to <clears throat> people I chat to, but I've tried many different things, a lot of them interesting, but the one thing that I've found which has been absolutely phenomenal is the film of breathing. Mm. And me and Tara do it quite regularly in the mornings, first thing, and I do like 20 minutes of that, put mm. it on the, on the TV and just guide it and like you just breathe intensely for, um, with the breath holds and it's just an amazing you come out of it and you kickstart your day and you immediately in such an amazing space yeah and there's techniques like that that if you can a lot of teaching as well point to mm. the breath and using the breath but it's yeah it's quite a powerful technique i uh i think it's, it's really great so oh. um there was a point there about the parasites you were asking oh uh, yeah I never answered. So there's some really nice parasite cleansers, yes. natural things that we can use. And um, the bulldozer has some of it in. Okay. And there's another stronger version. of. When I say stronger, it doesn't mean like it's more chemically toxic. It's just got more of the natural herbs that go for the parasites. And we've, we're full of different parasites from mm. in, in our alimentary canal, in our gut, Mm. from uh, roundworms to tapeworms to all kinds of things and even tiny microscopic things and candida mm. we got parasites we, we have liver flukes we have parasites living in our organs I mean they, they're literally um, everywhere in the environment and uh, you know going to go and take a, a, a strong chemical that they will sell you over the counter is poisonous to our mm. bodies and also doesn't really effectively eliminate the parasites yeah. and there's some really incredible um, protocols and uh, one of them being these things that this friend of mine has introduced me to um, another one is uh, one that we have growing here in, in the Western Cape it's, um, it's aloe vera aloe ferox actually mm. it's a crystallized sap they take from the aloe Sure. And it has massive detox and also natural, I don't like to use the word laxative, mm. but stimulate you to, to eliminate all, to, to get your body to eliminate all the, the toxins in your body. It's a massive gut detoxification, uh, parasite cleanse and everything. And you can just imagine, you know, having parasites in your body that mm. you, you, you don't really want to be there. And they, they're taking a lot of the energy and the vitality from, from yeah. us. And also some of them have apparently, according to research, could possibly be the, the cause disease as well. Yes. Um, so to, to have a, a, a bit of a, a detox and a cleanse, like once every three or four months, to, mm. to really get in there and not just to get all the toxins out of our body, but to, to, to try and eradicate yeah. some of the parasites yes. is, is a powerful thing sure. um, to, to free up a lot of, if you want to say, energy and things Definitely. that we, your body yeah, can use for other things. It actually drains your energy, some yeah. of these parasites. It's something that I think we've spoken about a lot and I think we could chat about for hours on that topic specifically. I know you and Natasha are involved in, in certain people who have come to you guys for help with that. Mm. So um, if guys are more interested, I'll definitely... Or do you... Does Natasha do consultations with people? Do you? She help? does. How is it? Well, she's uh, a nutritionist, so she started utilizing these parasite cleansers and detoxes for people. So, mm. um, yeah, another one, another great detox is uh, niacin. Yes, that's also something you put me onto, which I've been using regularly. Yeah, which... Vitamin B three. Yeah. Um, and then what and it does is it flush. dilates the blood vessels in the, below the skin surface, so you get this like red glow to your skin, mm. and you start flushing. 
And uh, through sweat, um, going for mm. like a, a run or walk outside, especially in the day when it's warm, mm. um, or a sauna or a hot bath. Yeah. So you sweat and a lot more of the toxins, because it's one of the organs of elimination. Mm. A lot of the toxins, heavy metals, um, all kinds of things come out through the skin. And the niacin um, is also a, a very strong antioxidant um, and is very, very beneficial for, for apparently for the, the telomeres and the uh, telomerase uh, structure of our DNA, which is basically where our DNA, um, when, we, when the cell replicates, the telomeres are involved in the replication. As yeah. Every time we have a replication, the telomeres apparently get a bit shorter, but this apparently can be slowed down and repaired with very, very strong antioxidants. And apparently... Niacin, which is yeah. basically vitamin B3s, is um, yes. at at higher doses, is um, really beneficial for for, for 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 DNA health as well, Amazing. not just for detox. So there's a lot of like very simple ways that yes. are not expensive. A lot to, of simple natural ways yeah. that you can heal your body. Um, sure, we we could chat for hours. I know we've probably got about five minutes left on there. Yeah, starting to flash there. What I want to start to end off with is. Uh, so you've obviously been in a leadership position for quite a while and mentoring people mm. and uh, working with people in our industry and moving forward, you've got such a wealth of knowledge. Are you looking to, I know you mentioned to me, looking to do mentoring, is that correct? Or to help people in their lives or what are you, what are you yeah, looking to so, do? So you know, in the work that we've done in aviation mm. is um, you know, getting into a position where you know the company, a company or an organisation puts you know the trust in you to mm. be able to to guide people and to help them in their careers to, to you know to build uh, the capabilities and knowledge and abilities and belief in themselves to be able to move forward and become really successful at what they do. And obviously, in the industry we we're in mm. is obviously in the aviation side. Mm. But um, through all that and all through all the the learning I did for that specifically, that task of uh, mentoring is obviously not just relevant for aviation. You obviously have to have a knowledge of the industry or the the information that you're trying to 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 motivate people in. Mm -hmm. But I think inherently, I've always loved to 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 give back mm -hmm. service. Um, to help people. If I see people struggling, it's my natural tendency to just want to help them. Mm. Um, if I see people who show interest in something, I get enthusiastic and I want to try and like give my mm. two cents worth. So in everything that I've learned through my profession um, and in the mentorship I've given in the role in, in the organization that we, we're in and learning those, those, those pathways and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the skills to be able to try and you know, guide people and help them. In all the things that I've learned personally in my life, I find it's like a natural flow to want to be able to help people to be able to find these methodologies and let, it's, it's not about teaching, it's about just waking things up in people. Mm -hmm. And if they inherently feel that passion and need to want to, 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 to work in their lives, to make their lives a more harmonious place, is to be able to help them to access those places. Mm. So for me, it's it's something I really would love love yeah. to do more if I could. Definitely. Yeah. No, I think you guys you would be uh, brilliant at it. So definitely. Yeah. Um, and I think between you and Natasha combined, uh, the, your your knowledge and interest in the wellness field. Uh, if people out there are interested, um, yeah, I'll definitely mm -hmm. send them your way. Uh, to yeah, it's been amazing to hear the story yeah. of people that have healed themselves through you guys and. Yeah. Um, that's what I just remembered what I wanted to say earlier. We were talking about the fear and making decisions based on fear. I think it was, I've also said this before, Jim Carrey who said it best. Yeah. And a lot of people consider him a bit crazy, but when you say something to the effect of we either make decisions based on love or fear, yeah. you're going to try and choose love most of the time, but a lot of the times we make decisions um, out of fear based on practicality. We, mm. we think it's practical, but it's actually a fear based decision. So it's. Mm. So we're recognizing that try not to let the fear run our lives. That's it. Um, well, ultimately, um, everything that we have in our lives, everything from our health to everything we attach materialistically, relationships, is all around emotion.
because your emotion pulls you in a direction and you're attached to something emotionally. So everything you have is literally emotion. The more where you become of your emotional states and, and how you act in your life, the more you refine what you actually are creating in your life. Mm-hmm. And I guess to uh, as well, um, another thing is like the people you choose to have around you. 100%. Um, I mean, look at, what Natasha, look what Natasha has done for my life. Not that I rely on her as a crutch, but together I wake up and it's like seamless. She's such a positive um, influence on my life and she's got such a powerful emotional state on her own that um, it can't, that, uh, you, know, you can't help but let it rub off on you. So, you know, to have those people around you is also, I think, pretty awesome. The environment around you in terms of people also has been quite an eye-opener for me. Yep. So it's an integral part of maintaining mm-hmm. that. Good life. On that note, uh, this camera's flashing around at me. I think we could definitely chat for hours and we're going to have to do another podcast yeah. in the future. Uh, yeah, is there anything else you want to end off with? Or no. Or should we end it on that note? Well, it's, thanks, uh, Darren. It's, yeah, it's been the first time I've ever had a, a <laughs> podcast. It's quite an experience. Yeah, I know. It's yeah. awesome for me. First time having somebody... It's always a first starting up this podcast, yeah. chatting to you. We've chatted, as I yeah. mentioned, plenty of times before. Mm. And every time... When I come through Philadelphia and I see you, we can chat for hours. So it's um, mm. it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. And yeah. uh, I hope even if one person takes something away from this, that for me is yeah. also why I want to do this. It's amazing just to, you know, I've learned so much from podcasts and uh, it's changed mm. my life uh, specifically. So that's kind of the goal of this one. And uh, everyone's just right on that idea. So thanks. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.